habitat modeling to delineate appropriate fuel for tortoise habitat uh, at crew. And how are you guys in the back? Do you want those back lights off or is it more comfortable having them on? Perfect. Hello everyone. Um, can everyone hear me in the back okay? I'm kind of losing my voice right now, so I'll try to keep speaking up. Um, my name is Diana Locher. I'm a senior over at Florida Gulf Coast University. This project was for my undergraduate senior research project, and what it is, it's GIS modeling for gopher tortoise habitat here at Crew. So a little bit what I'm going to talk about today, we're going to briefly go over why this is important and how it applies to crew, and then some of the methods, how we got the characteristics for the mapping, and more into the mapping, the surveys we did, and the preliminary results. So the gopher tortoise is listed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Commission as um, it's a listed protected species in the extreme western portion of its range. However, here in Florida, it's not currently listed, but it is on the um, list to be listed, if that makes sense. Uh, FWC, though, does list it as threatened, so it is protected here. So this does cause some problems when it comes to developing land, because then they need to get permits and surveys on the land to see if there's tortoises, to relocate the tortoises. And this comes up as a bigger problem on larger properties, because if you have so much land, you can't survey the entire property for tortoises. So you may only survey one portion and maybe find two tortoises and say, okay, there's two tortoises within two acres, we have 10 acres, maybe there's 10 tortoises. But realistically, since you didn't survey the whole thing, you don't actually know. So it's really guesswork at that point. So the problems with these surveys is they usually go out blind hoping, well for developers they're hoping they don't find tortoises, <laughs> but for the rest of us we may be hoping they do find tortoises. Um, so how this really got started here is we wanted to go from using a model as a predictive tool to tell us where gopher tortoises are so that we could go out already knowing where they should be so we have a better chance of finding them. Um, most of the maps we have of gopher tortoises, they typically go from a borough survey to the mapping. So this is really going reverse, using the mapping as a predictive tool to find out where the tortoises are. And this is our survey area. So this is crew right here, and we focused on this northeast corner up there. So the characteristics for gopher tortoise habitat. When you're modeling, you need characteristics to put into the model so that you can get a better idea of what you're looking at. Um, this, our model is modeled after a paper by Baskran. He is a scientist up in Georgia. His work looked at the same type of thing where you're going from model to burrows. And it, he looked, these characteristics right here, slope, distance to streams, and distance to roads, we accounted for these with an elevation layer. So with the elevation layer, to make sure it was somewhat accurate, we went out and we found out, okay, at 18 feet, this area is a drainage swale, or it's permanently inundated with water. So we knew that 18 feet on the property was inundated with water all the time, up to 26 feet in the northeast corner. That's when you start hitting roads and you get off the property. So 24 feet was really the highest elevation on the property. So getting a better idea of how that elevation affects um, gopher tortoises out there. So with the soil variable, Basker and he focused more on um, clay within the soils, but then going back and looking at Ashton's work, who also compiled gopher tortoise habitat characteristics, he looked more at how fast the soil would drain. So if you have more clay in the soil, it's a denser substrate, so it doesn't drain as quickly as sand will. So for gopher tortoises, you obviously want the soils to be more sandy because you want it to drain faster because they don't want to be swimming in their burrows. <laughs> they don't like swimming. Um, so we used a soil type layer to get that kind of information. Now this is a list of characteristics that we were able to compensate for with a habitat type layer. So something like pastures down here would come up in our chart as citrus groves or something like the freshwater prairies would come up. And that gave us an idea, like freshwater prairies are gonna be inundated with water for either seasonally or a majority of the year. And citrus groves, well, we don't have citrus groves on cruise, so we didn't have to worry about it. 
So this is our focus area. Um, that's gate one, two, three, and five. Some of you may have been out on these trails here. There are two campsites, one at gate three and one at gate five. And the reason we chose this area is because back in 2008, Dr. Almond from Florida Gulf Coast University had partnered with a member of FWC to do gopher tortoise mark recapture studies and also burrow surveys. So unfortunately, due to circumstances, we didn't have that burrow data to use today. However, it was a good starting point because we knew that somewhere in this area, back eight or nine years ago, there were gopher tortoises. So we were hoping by starting in this area that we would get a better idea of where gopher tortoises are on the property since we know they had been there previously. So for soil rankings, you'll kind of see this ranking continuously throughout the presentation, the high, medium, low. The high represents that you're going to have a higher chance of finding burrows in that area of the map. The low is a lower probability of finding burrows in that area. And the medium is you might still find burrows, but maybe not. So it's kind of that in between for the two. <coughs> so for the soils, how we did this, the high ranking soils, as I kind of mentioned earlier, would be your sandier soils, very fast draining so that they aren't sitting in water for a majority of the year. Um, which is better for gopher tortoises because since they're a fossorial species, they do grow, as I mentioned. And for the low quality habitat, this is something that was still somewhat sandy, but it was very low in drainage, which meant that this right here was filled with water either for the entire year or seasonally. And this medium was a kind of in-between drainage between the good habitat and the low quality habitat. So it may have been in water, but not as long as this low region of the map. So this is our habitat ranking. Um, same thing again, the high habitat quality would be your upland pine habitats. And this was typically a characteristic of having an open canopy. The open canopy allows for more ground vegetation for gopher tortoises to forage on. And this low habitat was classified with having more water in it and a denser canopy. So they weren't really out in the, they shouldn't be out in this area according to the model since there's not enough forage and it's more classified by having water year round. And this intermediate one <coughs> kind of had that interspersed um, canopy cover. So it wasn't necessarily a fully closed canopy, but it wasn't as open as your upland habitat that you have around the road here. So this is our elevation map. Um, the red, if you guys can see, the red is like 18 feet going up to the 24 feet, as I mentioned. So we had a few problems with this layer. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to incorporate it into the final mapping, but it did prove useful in kind of truthing our soil and our habitat layers to make sure that they were consistent with what the elevation was telling us. So even though two feet of elevation doesn't seem like a big difference, just from surveying, we had a transect here, that I'll show you guys in a little bit, but right in this area going from the purple to the blue, I stood there and took this picture and looking back, you can see that this habitat is entirely different from that one. So in this, we're standing in kind of like a freshwater marsh prairie, and you're looking back up into upland habitat. So that two feet in elevation really made a difference for habitat type and soil type as well. So this is kind of showing you again, that's the soil map laid underneath this elevation map. So you can kind of see, okay, these small circles are associated with changes in soils. And you can see the changes in elevation being associated with the change in soils as you go further into the wetland. So this is our final map. It combined the soil and the habitat qualities. And as I said, the elevation couldn't be combined on this. but this good habitat was your characteristics of sandy, fast draining soils, upland habitat, places where you would typically expect to see gopher tortoises. And this was more inundated with water throughout the year, um, denser vegetation, stuff like that, where you wouldn't expect to see tortoises. And that medium was the kind of in between. So this gave us a better idea of what kind of habitat we were expecting out there to crew. So this is really the model we ended up working off of when it came to doing transects and surveys. So this right here gives you an idea. These pink lines are our transects. We had nine transects set up, and the way they were laid out, they were unbiased to previous known data of where burrows were on the ground. 
However, they weren't totally random because we were trying to get roughly 30% good habitat covered, around 30% medium, and around 30% bad. That way we could really test the accuracy of this model. And we actually went out and we did all these surveys um, this past weekend in teams that were supervised by people who knew what gopher tourist burrows were, since there were also a lot of armadillo burrows out there as well. So this is our preliminary results. This shows you the black dots are where we found burrows on the property. We had 22 burrows total. Of those 22, four of them were in bad habitat. And they were like right on the edge here. So there's those three there, right on the edge from going good to bad. And that one, which is really close to a medium habitat, so I'll explain that in a little bit. But that just gives you an idea of where we found these burrows along all of our transects this past week. So something we talk about, um, accuracy of the habitat layers. We quickly find out when we went out there that the habitat types were not necessarily what they were supposed to be. So this was supposed to be upland um, pine flatwoods and there was vegetation over our heads. So it's uh, not exactly what we thought it was. And there were certain habitat variables that were very variable in value. So something like mixed scrub habitat. I know Tiffany's team went out on one of the transects expecting mixed scrub, and they actually ended up in pop ash slough, two <laughs> feet of water. So that, that wasn't, your model's only as good as what you put into it. So that was a little bit hard to work with. Um, also, microhabitat values. So as I mentioned earlier, Baskaran, his work is done in Georgia. So those habitat variables that he uses may not necessarily be the same for our southwest gopher tortoise populations. I know work Dr. Almond is doing with gopher tortoises out at Del Nor Wiggins, their behavior differs from the populations you have in northern Florida and Georgia. So these microhabitat variables might be different as well for our gopher tortoises here at Crew than they are from the gopher tortoises up in Georgia. Um, another thing to consider was length of disturbance versus layer accuracy. So we're talking about disturbances like hurricanes, seasonal flooding, uh, fires, stuff like that where you would expect drastic changes in habitat. We weren't exactly sure how up to date the habitat layers were, but if some of those layers were done four or five years ago, that's something that would make a big difference to this environment. Because if they initially map this right after a burn, that's going to be a different environment than what we see out there today that maybe hasn't been burned or hasn't been affected by a hurricane or seasonal flooding very recently. Another thing was size of ecotones. So if we go back, we all know that out in the field you don't have a clear line as you're walking out there where you go from good habitat to bad habitat. There might be a 20 to 30 foot range where this transitions from good to bad. And the interesting thing about this transect here is it went immediately from good to bad, back to good, back to bad, very rapidly. So those three points that were in the bad area, they were still relatively close to the good. So due to considering ecotones, that could kind of explain that factor for those, as well as for that dot right there. Uh, survey accuracy. I know when we were out there, we were on 20 foot belt transects, so you had two people in the middle and two people on the edges, and the two people on the edges were supposed to be looking in, but due to the density of some of this ground cover, you may have only been able to see two feet on either side of you, so there may have been missed burrows um, in between the transects. Also adjusting for vegetation, at certain points you had to go around trees, piles of thorns, sawgrass. <laughs> So you would have to end up, your person on the end of your transect might have to go out another 15 feet before they're able to come back in. So that right there was another thing to consider with um, survey accuracy. And real quickly, I want to note that all of these layers, I did not make these myself. These are from FWC and um, the Water Management District. I was just able to manipulate them. So that's initially their work. Um, I want to say a big thank you to Dr. Almond and Tiffany Thornhill, without which these maps would not be as awesome as they are, and <laughs> to their survey volunteers who really toughed it out last weekend. <laughs> and, any questions? Um, I'm ignorant of the biology of, of these species. Um, <clears throat> 
when I'm thinking about that cluster, is it possible that just one or two individuals made multiple boroughs mm -hmm. in the same area? Yes. That's what you're saying so, with that? Um, going back right in mm -hmm. about this area right here, there's actually a tree that we came across that had three different boroughs within a good five foot radius. Mm -hmm. So that could have been the same tortoise, and all three of those may have led to the same burrow, but we were counting burrow entrances as an individual burrow. So that's possible that it all belonged to the same tortoise. Okay. And one more question. How old were those layer files from HWC? I'm not know? entirely sure. So that was that was one thing that we probably should have looked into, especially for the habitat types, um, being affected by the disturbances and all. Wait. Yeah, but I, I, I understand the limitation of that. But the truth is, if you want to try to apply this to a larger landscape, you need to use the files you got. Mm -hmm. So, so their their ability to predict or not predict is probably really important. Usually, that wasn't my question. Was it comments? <laughs> <laughs> I had another comment where I think I I hope in my life I never have to be the speaker after Mike Duver. <laughs> I was thinking that. I, I did a good job. Cool. <laughs> Especially with handmade figures like that. That was pretty awesome. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Mike Owen would be worse. Oh, Mike Owen would be worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do have a question. Okay, so question. Um, I never thought about this before. Some of the stuff that, that John Cassani and I are doing with frog calls is that we're struggling with this idea of if you, if you uh, go to a place and listen for frogs and you don't hear anything, that's not evidence that they're not there. They just might not be calling. I never thought about that for gopher tortoise surveys. And I'm wondering whether um, it might be really interesting to go back with a different group of people, run the same transit, see what your numbers are, and start to get at this idea of what's the probability that a person who does a survey before development might say no gopher tortoises when really there are some in there. You know, that, 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 that piece of, of um, not finding gopher tortoises where they are, I think, seems really cool. This was cool, too. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe for someone else's seat. Yes. <laughs> so actually, I guess that wasn't a question. <laughs> I'm curious, did you know how many armadillo birds found out there as well? I did not keep track, but I know on our transects, we found a lot more armadillo burrows. So like this transect right here, as soon as we started finding gopher tourist burrows, we did start finding armadillo burrows. I'd say it was about one for one or two for one when it came to armadillo burrows out there. So the armadillos were kind enough to mark their entrances with an A and then the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, well, the theirs, theirs were a lot more dome shaped <clears throat> and they were steeper going down. So the gopher tortoises, they're more of like a half moon shape and they kind of gradually go in, at, whereas an armadillo, a lot more dome shaped and it goes kind of straight down in comparison. Yes, I think another element, those of us that have done gopher tortoise work for years, I think gopher tortoises move with the wet season. Yeah. So it would be good, and it gives a false uh, number count because you may see active burrows versus inactive burrows, and then during the season that's going to change. So it might be to add something to that in the future. You might go back and survey those burrows seasonally and see yeah. if that's what's really happening. Yeah. That we did actually mark these as active or inactive, and pretty much all of them were inactive. I think except for this one right here. Um, especially in this area, it looks like, because I was in that dense brush that was over my head, and it looks like they've been abandoned for at least two years, but with seasonality of flooding because of how close this is to the wetland, they might just come in when it's a lot drier, or when it's been disturbed more. Or if you burn it. Yeah, or if you burn it. <laughs> yeah, we invade that area. Sorry, I'm sorry. Which one did you say was active? Um, this one right here. Right there? Okay, thank you. Did you find, uh, were any of the transects burned recently? And yes. So did you find more of the burrows? <laughs> oh, no. Yes and no. So, <laughs> right down here, this area, I believe, was burned very recently. I would say sometime in the past couple months. Um, this burrow, though, was just before we got to this burned area, kind of right around there. We did find a lot of box turtles, though, in the burned area, so that was kind of cool. But we didn't see gopher tortoises in that area. <laughs> Any more questions? Is there shared use between the two, then, between gopher tortoises and armadillos? Do they ever seem to use? 
I would think so. I don't see why not. I mean, why go through the work of making a burrow if it's already there? So <laughs> I, don't, I don't see why not. I mean, save, save energy that way. There you go, from the turtle man himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, all the time of no. fire, <laughs> when yeah. other creatures go into the tortoise burrow, well, they use the armadillo burrow. Oh, I'm going in there, it's an armadillo. Too steep. What, a gopher tortoise going in the Do they use them the same? I Not would. an tortoise. Okay. Gopher for all others. No, whatever. Oh, species. Other, species other species. Other species, yeah. Other species might use it the same, but same. I wouldn't think but the commensal species, they may go into armadillo burrow as well. Because shelter, shelter. So does that make the armadillo a keystone species? Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're getting deep there. <laughs> I would want to say yes, but you know, armadillos aren't my specialty. So. <laughs> Gonna have to say me. <laughs> Thank you so much.